Good evening. Uh, before uh, introducing Professor Gunther Benesch, uh, I would like to take this opportunity, since I think many of you were still upstairs in the uh, soft room when the uh, diploma reviews were going on, to take this opportunity to, to thank all the people who came from afar to act as uh, critics for this, uh, for this session, uh, as well as all the tutors who uh, helped in organizing it, as well as all the students who uh, presented the work, as well as all the students who took part in, 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 uh, in all the day's discussions uh, uh, for, uh, for this fantastic day. I've also, just a few minutes ago, uh, in the exhibition hall, um, thanked uh, Professor Benesch for making the exhibition possible, and uh, um, Vincent Bandy and uh, his crew for uh, organizing everything, as well as uh, Linda Brown and Andrew McKenzie from DAA for uh, putting together what uh, uh, is a fantastic uh, exhibition. Um, last night, um, and I think it's, it just is a sort of coincidence that we were talking about the juxtaposition, in a way, of the issue of, of minimum and that of fragmentation. And after David Tepefield's presentation last night, when I referred to it in terms of the, the, his work in, in, in terms of problematizing, in a sense, the idea of the architecture that in some way has been reduced, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that tonight we uh, are going to see the work of an architect who, in a sense, I think, has been problematizing the idea of the fragment, um, dealing with uh, a, a fantastic range of uh, projects in uh, over 40 years of, uh, of practice, uh, addressing questions of use, uh, landscape, site, the way that people actually work inside buildings in, in, a, in a remarkable uh, way. I think in, in terms of specifically, for example, the issue of landscape, whereas last night we saw this more classical re relationship between interior and the landscape in terms of the pictorial representation of landscape, in many of uh, Professor Benish's work, there seems to be a much more lyrical relationship with the site where the interior of the building becomes, in a sense, a kind of landscape of the interior that always develops systematic ambiguities between interior and exterior. And we're all very pleased that uh, Gunther Benesch is here uh, to uh, give us the, the lecture. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Gunther Benesch. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you here today. I would like to talk about our work and our practice. I'll show some slides. These are slides of buildings we did. In the course of the past 40, 45 years, we have designed and supervised the construction of about 120 or 130 buildings. And we have certainly designed five or 600 buildings or 700, I don't know, sports facilities, districts, and so forth, most of them for architectural competitions. We enjoy designing for competitions. They give us an opportunity to try out new ideas even to risk things you might not expect the client to accept. So I would like to have the first slide, please. A, a decade or so ago, for example, we designed a Congress Center for the Hanover Trade Fair Company for several thousand visitors. Hi over the central green of the exhibition grounds. The design went to the limits of what was feasible for us at the time, both technically and in the realm of form. The building hovered above the site, supported on only three legs, 
presumably the design was too far removed from what the trade fair management considered acceptable according to their aesthetic norms. Perhaps they were also unwilling to take any risk. Next one. The jury were divided. The architects favored our submission, but in the end a different design was chosen. Nothing spectacular, a design that kept within the confirm, confines of what was familiar and which already look, looks banal. There are many aesthetic norms. The eye of the beholder differs according to age, social standings, education and background. Some seek innovation, others seek the familiar. A third group, as we are witnessing in Berlin at this time, want to latch on to the 19th century. But even in these not precisely defined groups, aesthetic norms are constantly changing. Next one, please. If we design buildings capable of pleasing most people today, those people, those buildings would look old-fashioned tomorrow. A good work of art, and uh, I believe that in connection with aesthetic norms, architecture is art, cannot be accepted by everybody at the time of its creation. Parts of it are bound to displease some people. That's normal. With regard to aesthetic norms, next one please. With regard to aesthetic norms, the history of art may be regarded as a permanent rebellion against currently applica applicable norms. In our work, too, we must from time to time question the, the limits of what is known, tried, and tested, and accepted, and overstep those limits, because that's how archi architecture evolves, and we evolve in the same way. Competition designs are ideal for this approach. They are more open than the designs that result from direct commissions. With competition designs, we don't yet have a client. We have more freedom, and the design can evolve more freely. Next one. We don't have to immediately justify every step we take. That's a design for a church in Rome. We often overdo things, but what if we do things that cause a problem today will find favor tomorrow. As times goes by, those components which first seem unusual and unacceptable will become integrated into the overall work. Some, some time after the design for the Congress Center in Hanover, we designed a so-called media center, center for the municipality of Krefeld, that's a medium-sized town near Cologne, on a very long and narrow inner city plot of land. A 150 meter long, 20 meter wide building two to three stories high, supported on long legs over an old town square. Here, we had clearly, I would say, not even consciously, taken further the idea that had previously led to our design for the Hanover Congress Center. And now the time was right. Our design was awarded first place. Yet it was never built. 
I didn't pursue the matter further, but I suppose that there was a lack, lack of funds for the project. But uh, two or three weeks ago, the client came and asked me to continue with this work. What would seem interesting about the, this design is, next one, that seven facades are created instead of two, or at, at the most four, in normal buildings. There are two along the longitudinal sides, two along the narrow sides, the view from above and below, and finally, the surface of the square. Beneath the building, there was a large pool of water in which the shiny underside of the building covered with murals would have been reflected. We felt that an idea like this could have enhanced the spot, especially when compared to a normal solution where a building stands on a spot, occupies it and blocks it. Next one. About 10 years ago, we had to design the tower block for a regional bank in Stuttgart. Up to that time, tower blocks had, as a rule, borne witness to the problems of their stability. We felt that these problems, which had made their presence felt in the structure of the tower blocks that were common up until then, and which stifled many other possibilities, didn't merit such precedence. Buildings of this height could now be sturdy without such visible exertion. And this would leave form open for other problems and responses, for example, to urban surroundings, to forms themselves, etc. The tower block could now blend in with the city. It no longer had to isolate itself and was not exclusively concerned with itself, like those tower blocks that were solely concerned with problems of structural stability. We were not able to see this design through either. My feeling is the client still felt the design was unfamiliar when it was presented to him. To today, about 10 years later, the client assured me that he is very sorry that he didn't have this block built. Well, we were very sorry about it too. <laughs> Our architect's practice has repeatedly changed in terms of, of its size, its organization, the number of people involved, the type of work, etc. We have had to adapt to the work that has come our way. We often felt that no more than 40 architects should work together in our office. A size like this allows many things to be done more easily. People know each other, they know what others are thinking and doing, People do each other favors without organization. To cope with our work, we often had to work with more than 40 architects. Then we subdivided the practice. From 1968 to 1972, for example, in an office set up specially for this task on the Munich Oberwiesenfeld, we planned the Munich Olympic Park. Uh, I should say the roof was uh, realized in cooperation with Leonard and Andre and Fry Otto, and the landscape 
was done with my friend Günter Cimek. And for some years now, there have been two architects' practices, practices in Stuttgart, one in the suburb of Sillenbuch, one in the city center. The latter also has a branch office in Lübeck. Manfred Sabatke is going to direct the practice in Sillenbuch. Stefan Benisch, my son, is in charge of the city center practice. In both practices, we are currently planning several buildings and complexes. Our Sillenbuch practice, practice is planning, next one, new buildings and conversions in the Munich Olympic Park. a new control tower at Nuremberg Airport. A residential complex in Ingolstadt Hollerstauden. Elementary and secondary school buildings in Ingolstadt Montessori School. A spa building in Bad Elster and conversions in the school complex in Lorch. Our city center practice is planning an administrative building for the Landesgirokas at the Regional Saving Bank in Stuttgart. The Roman Catholic St. Benno Grammar School in Dresden. an administrative building for the Schleswig-Holstein Regional Insurance Institution. Buildings for the Institute for Forestry and Environment Protection in Wageningen in Holland. An administrative and exhibition building in Tauberbischofsheim for, his, for uh, for, for v, it's called in German VS, that's a factory uh, building and producing chairs and tables for schools and so on. And we hope very much <laughs> a center for performing arts in Bristol in England. The Lothar Günther Buchheim Museum in Feldafing. I say it, it, I don't know that each thing has a history. If I don't know if you know who Lothar Günther Buchheim is, that he is the author and of Das Boot. You have heard uh, Das Boot, the film and the book and so on. <laughs> Next one the Danish National Archives in Copenhagen. While both practices are currently working together to plan the new Academy of Fine Arts in Berlin. For the last three decades at least, and probably even longer than that, these are Bavarians, you know? <laughs> 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 For the last three decades at least, and probably even longer than that, we have regarded ourselves as producing a tailor-made rather than an off-the-pack product. As bespoke tailors, so to speak, we can best effort to do what we are best at, and that's how we see it. And we can limit those things we don't like so much to what is necessary. Working as a bespoke tailor is more involved, but more interesting too. We invest a lot of effort in our plans, possibly too much, but this work isn't a burden for us. 
we spin our jobs around looking at them from angles from inside and out gaining insights and discovering new aspects certain things can be recognized and named exactly others can be recognized by association beyond the various levels of our reality and in varying degrees of detail in fact we are constantly on a voyage of discovery we also have to take care of those things that are the same the same whatever the task and of course we do so well and reliably especially as the client sees this as the prime criterion by which to ju judge whether we, he can trust his architect this that's a very early building we did in ulm that's a we call it fachhochschule a special a special uh, uh, university this was the first uh, what do you say pre precast pre precast pre uh, large precast concrete building in germany for our work however it's the individual task special quality which is foremost in our mind we are sure that all tasks have their special qualities even those that appear unspectacular in all tasks the components are mixed in a special new way very often in a way that is surprising as a rule it's only later that it becomes clear what was waiting to come out with our help how far the task can be expanded on and will allow such expansion and which components will finally come to dominate the design there's also the question as to whether these dominant components can order other components which vary in their effect in the whole or indeed whether the former can subordinate themselves to the latter here here let, let me sh show you the example of our work in Bad Elster the spa building of Germany's oldest spa situated in the most southwesterly tip of Saxony Saxony is was a part of East Germany and not far from the great spas of Bohemia now the Czech Republic is to be renovated and modernized parts of this old complex have to be demolished the technical equipment has to be renewed and some things have to be built anew on top of that some specific specifically architectural problems are emerging for example we have to decide how to deal with the existing form and elements they are admired locally but are weak compared to the layout of other spas today's spa building is made up of several buildings from various periods the first were built in 1850 the last during the GDR regime quite disparate architectural forms have come together that may appear strange and slipshod but that's how Bad Elster Spa building is and it's a listed building what can we do with it what can we preserve 
what has to be renewed and what can be added what should the new additions be like and the old parts and how should the parts interrelate our, or relate to the building as a whole at present the various buildings making up the spa building are situated around a large rectangular courtyard which up to now has been used as a maintenance engineering yard. The idea now is to turn the complex around. In future the inner courtyard is to be the beautiful atrium with floor coverings that are formally and materially of a higher quality with plants and new buildings with covered and open air swimming pools, deck chairs, reception, both as a whole and in terms of, it, of its parts. This area is to be aestheticized. The complex is to go through a shift in emphasis and to be upgraded both in itself and in its relationship to its location. The new buildings to be erected in the courtyard will be lean and precise. Seemingly non-material features, light, sun, shadow, noise, smell, views of the formalistic green and of the upgraded facades of the buildings bordering the courtyard will now dominate the formalistic floor covering inside the courtyard will probably be the focus of the complex as a whole. These are exercises for the floor. We'll have to see how the whole thing develops. It might, might, might be that the inner courtyard has a certain in it fairy tale traits. We don't expect to encounter any serious structural problems. That means that structural features and other constructions can recede into the background. Columns can become lines and walls can become surfaces, which in turn can become colorful graphic compositions and together with sun, light and time special aesthetic events. Our practice has existed for almost 45 years now and quite a lot has come to fruition in that time. It looks it looks <laughs> the pictures okay it looks quite a mixture in re retrospect, but we needn't be embarrassed. Of course, some buildings are better than others, but there's no building we should be ashamed of. They are all still presentable, or rather nearly all, for some of them have been spoiled by clients or other architects. They clearly thought that these complexes could be modified without further ado. And in the end, we can't prevent it. However, we do keep a closer eye on certain complexes, which we regard as landmarks of our work. That's the swimming uh, and diving uh, hall in Munich. Most clients come to us when they encounter problems with the buildings we have planned. We look into the matter even if the problem seems small and the effort involved great. So it was that we recently returned to the school building in Lorch, which we had built between 1958 and 1960. Here we, here we added an extra story 
to one wing and furnished a new facade for the other. The wooden framed windows had to be replaced and the asbestos cement sheeting needed replacing. Technically, it was not a problem, but architecturally, it was. How were the new elements to present themselves without denying their newness, but also with their putting the old elements to shame? That is easier said than done. For today's colors, you see here, for today's colors, materials and constructions are stronger and also more, more assertive than they were 35 years ago. And they tend to stand out above the old, which is respected only for its history. Or again, take the case of the conversion of the small office building in Stuttgart Kronprinzenstraße, realized between 1968 to 1969. The building had, had had an unlucky past. Stuttgart City Council had at first planned to concentrate part of the inner city traffic flow in this street to provide protection against the likely noise. We had suspended a glass shield in front of the building. This glass was also tinted to protect the south-facing facade from the sun. Logically, the rooms were then equipped with air conditioning. Soon after this, however, the city center was made traffic free. And there was this small building with its extreme protection against traffic noise in a pedestrian <laughs> breaking. <coughs> with its glass protective screen in a quite wrinkled situation, the building appeared strangely overprotected. A bank bought the building and asked us to convert it. A lot was changed, in fact. Only the structure was left untouched, and yet people had got used to the glass facade. We wanted, too, to keep this, albeit in a modified form. The dark, inflexible panes of glass were replaced by clear, movable slats. These protected the south-facing facade against rain and the heat of the sun. They tie in with the air conditioning plants. The result was a weaker, that's the same facade is seen by another uh, viewpoint. The res result was weaker, more detailed and flexible protective shield behind which wooden framed vertically pivoted windows could be installed. This type of window enhances the interior functionally and formally. We will find ourselves with difficult problems if we have to restructure the Olympic Stadium. The Munich Park is a great landmark of our work and the symbol of a certain social situa situation in Germany around 1970, as well as one of Munich's great monuments. One might feel that this complex shouldn't be changed appreciably. In recent decades, not many positively regarded uncontroversial monuments of German history have been created. The few that there are should be preserved. On the other hand, that's not our problem. The question as to whether this Olympic sta Stadium should be altered or indeed recast 
from a popular stadium to the commercial complex of a soccer club ought not to be answered by an architect or indeed left to his responsibility. This decision ought to be made in Munich by the people and the politicians representing them. We did what we had to do there in the years between 1968 and 1972. Now it's up to the people of Munich. Should the city decide to rebuild, we would want to ensure that the stadium is altered as decently as possible and that as many components of the existing stadium can be preserved as possible. But here too, the actual problem is not a technical one. Of course, structures spanning great distances are required and the plexiglass sheeting covering the roof has to be replaced. But the real pro problems are elsewhere. They concern the question as to whether people want and are able to preserve this popular Munich monument and that includes its social and political aspects. For three years now we have been concerned with the new Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Fine Arts on Pariser Platz. Let me say a few words about this project. Pariser Platz is a special place in Berlin's longest axis. Axes such as these are power lines, organizing whole districts in their multitudinous relationship. Pariser Platz at the Brandenburg Gate on the western edge of the Friedrichstadt quarter is a landmark. The Academy of Fine Arts was located there for many years and wants to return there. The Berlin Wall was just behind the Brandenburg Gate. You see the Brandenburg Gate in the middle of the picture uh, and behind this was uh, the wall and this part was e the eastern part of uh, Berlin. Western is outside. Berlin Senate issued regulation as to how the facades of the buildings bordering Pariser Platz were to be designed. Apart from dimensions and proportions, materials also were stipulated. The intention being that the appearance of the planned new square should match that of the original square. The original square was destroyed during and after the war. So that's uh, today's situation. And there, and there are no buildings left there apart from the Brandenburg Gate, gate and the old exhibition halls of the Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, left. Only a few people still remember the old square, which means that the Paris Pariser Platz now required has to resemble an image that nobody, nobody can describe. The stipulations seem corresponding, correspondingly vague and were probably not well thought out. You see, you see the uh, master plan and, and the academy is uh, the black one. The wish, is to, the wish is to have a square with a uniform image within the confines of solid perforated facades, but this ignores the fact that architectural phenomena are images of society. Who could presume to make such demands of Pariser Platz? Elected, elected political representatives are not qualified to make judgments about aesthetic norms. And uh, this is why institutions like the Academy of Fine Arts in Berlin were established. 
it would doubtless have been best to have consulted the academy and considered their advice, but this is just what was not done. The result is a quite unsatisfactory situation. I wouldn't try to res reconstruct the square that came into being in 19th century Berlin. This was an era marked by Prussian German arrogance, not an era, era I would like to latch on to. But if the intention were to latch on to the architecture of the former square, then this should not be done in terms of materials, but in architectonic terms. The specific architectonic characteristics of these old architectural forms was not their solid walls perforated by windows. Yet, this is precisely what is being stipulated, but the architectonic devices by means of which the triviality of the solid perforated facades, which could not be avoided in those days, were glossed over. People are probably also forgetting that the facades of those times were in fact very varied, and that what was common to them, apart from the materials available at the time, was the fact that all facades made use of an architectonic device borrowed from classicism, but did so in various forms. Such were the opportuni opportunities available in the 19th century. Most of those in positions of political responsibility were unable to resist the temptation of giving in to the popular but fairly uncritical demand for the good old days, which seemed to find their reflection in the old facades. Possibly these are the good old days that could seem good to us if we ignored their deprivation and problems. In our work before this time, we had tried, before this time, we had tried, if possible, not to adopt the forms used by past architectural styles. In an, in an attempt to satisfy Berlin's wishes, at least in spirit, we then adopted the method with the help of which the facades on the old Pariser Platz were developed, but not the materials. We then applied this method, method to components of our era, in so far as we could identify it. We saw the triviality of our era in the curtain wall. We then glossed over this with a new architectonic device developed out of the art world of our days. We feel that this is an appropriate approach for the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Fine Arts. However, we have to realize that it is more difficult, difficult to put this approach across, especially to those who want quick answers, even if this involves the risk that they will not be very long lasting. As I said, every job has its own problems and accents, and the components of each job are mixed in a new way. We feel that this procedure would open up new opportunities for architecture. In the architectural field, at least, our way of working is tied up with, with experimentation and with risks, too. That's a bon, a bon uh, 
parliament building entrance hall. We have been able to work this way until today, although we have been regarded with suspicion by certain representatives of large organizations who are unwilling to accept deviations from what they feel is tried and tested. We now see the worrying consequence of pro procedures in which even in the public sphere organizations which are no longer politically accountable to the public are brought in and equipped with power. Because they have committed a lot, these organizations have to eliminate risks even where these are only seen as possibility or suspicion. The result is that the freedom of maneuver needed for the development of, ar development of architecture is being restricted by the real pressures produced by these organizations. In German, that's uh, Schulcenter in Lorch. In German public sector buildings, at least, there has up to now existed the freedom for maneuver. Architecture needs to develop. Or at least one could create this room to move in spite of the fact that, that procedures, deadlines, costs, and technical regulations had to be adhered to in this sphere. But these procedures were concerned with these aspects and didn't preclude architectures with vitality. It was also in this context that public sector architectural, architectural competitions developed with great success. And in this climate, public sector architecture, that's the school in Oeringen, in this climate, public sector architecture of a high standard developed. School buildings, nurseries, old people's home, town halls, especially in small towns. Sitting on a judge panel recently, Sir Norman Foster described this situation with, with amazement and admiration. If the public sector now starts putting its buildings, which after all are the buildings of its citizens and not of politicians or investors, into the hand of investors and prime contractors, and in so doing, accept the procedure develop, developing, developed out of the problems these organizations have, then safe architecture dominated by tri triviality will also become established there. That's erring too. This architecture already dominates those areas in which the procedure of these organizations are the order of the day. That's good. <laughs> It's a school building, yes, in Frankfurt. As ever, it should be political commit committees that guarantee, represent, and are accountable for architecture's relatively, relative freedom. Auxiliary organizations shouldn't be given the chance via uh, the services they offer in the public sector to influence architecture or possibly even the de to determine its role. The result of such changes would probably be sorely felt in our work. We tend to consider the commissions we are given from many sides and to concern ourselves with them in great detail. We tend to look our, at our work, plenary, uh, plenar Salmbond, yeah. We tend to look at our work from every possible angle. One thing then leads to another. Details burgeon and take on a life of their own. 
narratives are then created. Here perhaps one can point the um, examples from literature where detail is not digression but it's the life and soul of this type of literature. Our architecture works in a similar way. We, the result of this method is probably easy to see in the Eichstätt University Library building. Naturally, you can also formulate the architecture of buildings in the same way as you would formulate an order to attack or a marching order, instruction for use or a scientif scientific treatise. Impressive works may be created in this way, but we have, have had little interest in this up to now. We, we may have to alter the way we work and plan buildings anyway, or at least always reconsider what we are doing. But there's another thing. The age, the age difference in our practice has meanwhile become considerable. And along with this, go differences in experience and world views. Results of age in the situation in which each individual has seen the world and formed his own picture of it. Someone who grew up in the countryside, barefoot in the sun and the rain, and ran over empty fields, will necessarily see the world differently from someone who spent his childhood, childhood in Starship Enterprise with Captain Kirk. Up to now, I have regarded our architecture as a mixture of components from various world views. And the way in which we work and the architecture developing out of it has of course provided the chance of including and integrating many worlds in our joint work. This can, for example, be recognized in the new debating chamber of the German Bundestag in Bonn, in which much is possible. He are juxtaposed the rationally planned supporting structure innovative light shafts, deconstructive elements, the large emotionally intended wooden bench in the lobby, the imposing links between the gallery, galleries which are far removed from any conventional notion of stairs, individual futuristic pieces of furniture, and more natural elements, for example, in the restaurant and the ceiling and the columns, subjectively painted by Nicola de Maria there. Large office buildings have a more difficult time of things. As a rule, they contain hundreds or perhaps more than a thousand identical workplaces. It takes effort to create different sectors and places of equal value. In such a situation, in such a situation, our endeavors to see and design a complex like this in many different ways are then practically forced to take their lead from other components. For example, when working on the new regional saving bank in Stuttgart, we try to find answers, answers to appeals relationships from the context of its urban surroundings. This resulted in a form which distinguishes between the site following the road and the site with a special relationship to the inner courtyard and its response to the outside world. 
although defined in their dimensions and outlines by the shape of the building, the facade were developed further in terms of color and graphics. And the entrance hall is formed at the location in the inner courtyard predetermined by the structure and so on. The building talks about itself, about its many relationship, its efforts, its special spots, and its entirety. An architectural form has been created which accepts the fact that a thousand people and more will work there, and what's, what is more, persuades us to recognize that this is not the only fact that matters. Most of the workplaces were subdivided into sectors with their own specific characteristics and situations. Special spots were highlighted, such as the inner courtyard, the entrance hall, the pulpit on the upper floor, and so on. In spite of the fact that the building had to follow the road, the complex as a whole is full of different details. Their parts relate to each other, to the building, and to their situation in many ways and at many levels. As I mentioned earlier, every job has its own specific the kindergarten Stuttgart. As I mentioned earlier, every job has its own specific components, and we must accept that buildings today look individual and varied. In the past, when binding canons of form were accepted, that may have been different. However, it may also be that in the past there were differences within the canon that we can no longer recognize at this distance in time. Such a distant perspective tends to draw things which are far apart together and to eliminate their nuance. If we looked more closely at history, I am sure we would notice differences there too, for instance, in Baroque and Renaissance architecture and earlier periods. In our practice, practice, we have handled both quick jobs and jobs that took a long time, major commissions and minor ones, houses bracketed by others, and freestanding buildings. Some buildings that were more complex, others that were simpler. Buildings to serve different purposes and for different clients. One quick job, for instance, was the High Solar Institute building at Stuttgart University. For well over two years, we worked on this building alone. The building's functions were ordinary. Laborator laboratories, offices, storerooms, etc. Nothing that could not have been housed in simple buildings. However, the client had obviously, obviously not engaged us to design a simple building. Clearly, he wanted something spectacular. That was how we understood it, and it suited us too. We wanted to experiment with form, and we had been thinking about such experiments for quite a long time, and we had paved the way for this experiment in other designs that hadn't been built. It was an attempt to build with large and small prefabricated industrial products and to find an organization of form for them. The logical answer was a spatial collage, which we then took to an extreme, however. Other consideration also played a part. 
For instance, the question as to how we deal with material objects in architecture, whether we treat them violently in architecture because they have been subjected to brute force during their production process, or try to leave them a vestige of freedom and individuality in our work. It was, as I said, an experiment in form and a quick building, but one which nevertheless had long roots that stretched back for years. The shortness of the time we worked directly on this building resulted in an all-pervading formal unity. In contrast, our work on the plenary chamber of the German Bundestag in Bonn was a long drawn out affair, a task we were associated with for more than 20 years. In the course of that long time, the brief changed repeatedly. Ministers came and went as the speakers of the Bundestag and officials and last not least architects who had worked in our practice. We had to revise our design several times. And after 20 years, of course, we ourselves were no longer the same people we had been at the start of the project. On the face of it, in fact, our work was almost bound to fail. But we, couldn't ne we could never have afforded that because for us, too, this building meant a great deal. We couldn't simply let it go, of course. Given this dis difficult situation, we looked for a way of organizing form which would allow individual elements a maximum of independence relative to the building as a whole and to the other parts an order in which the individual elements from different times and made by different people could find their place. A collage of different things that would now be able to assimilate. That's a representative stair for the president. The, to assimilate the different things that had been created in the course of two decades. A collage similar to those of the Dadaist, an order in which a plenary chamber can be juxtaposed to a foyer, a staircase next to trees, uh, VIP VIP rooms next to the Rhine, and so on. Without the formal aspects of these things needing to be coordinated and without them making any claims on one another. <laughs> Nevertheless, we had established some criteria that affected all elements. For instance, the things, the materials, the material objects should show mutual respect by keeping a certain distance from one another. The various elements should be themselves. That is, they should find expression in a way that corresponds uh, to their essence, individually and with self-assurance. Each element and each part should serve its purpose within the overall context. The non-material gaps assumed a special importance, etc. So it is a three-dimensional collage of formally uncoordinated individual, perhaps also individualistic elements. While the collage of the High Solar Institute building we saw just was, as we, as we have seen, coordinated in its elements. We thought that this type of architecture might be a metaphor 
for a free society in our time. And that is evidently how people do see this building. We have at least designed two building complexes which bear witness to the social, social political situation of our time the Olympic Park in Munich and the plenary chamber of the Bundestag in Bonn. The Olympic Park marks the beginning of an epoch that was characterized by Willy Brandt's words, let's risk more democracy. It was, it was very, very, for Germany, for the Germans, very important time. And the plenary chamber of the Bundestag doubtless marks a provisional end of that epoch. Today, however, we are living in a more conserv conservative times. This is recogniz recognizable in architecture too. For instance, in the new buildings in Berlin, we prefer not to resign ourselves to it. Finally, there is a question why we approach our work in this way. Why in every job we, took for the we look for the special distinctive elements. I, suppo po I suppose that's how we get to know the world around us. When we design and build a kindergarten, for example, we concern ourselves with the question of how people develop and grow up. And when, and when we design an old people's home, we see how a person's life comes to a close. In the case of an office building, we find out about life in a large administrative organization. Our work on the design of the plenary chamber gave us insights into the life of the parliamentarians and so on. These things interest us. Without this kind of involvement, our work would be a burden. So we make it interesting by using it as a means of understanding how the world around us functions. We have seen that's that's Bristol. <laughs> this will be Bristol. <coughs> Should be. <laughs> We have seen how the pleasure that work gives can disappear when it becomes a burden and that the chance of a good building is lost with a pleasure. There's another thing too. The basis of a good building is fairness towards everyone. Fairness towards children, the elderly, towards communities and clients towards contractors and everyone else involved. We expect the same fairness to be, sh that's the entrance of a kindergarten. We expect the same fairness to be shown to us, for instance, by clients. To, pr to produce good architecture, we simply need good terms. Of course, that includes money, but not only money. All of us have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of energy. If we had to use these limited resources to argue out disputes or fend off attacks, we wouldn't have the energy to produce good architecture. Fairness and good architecture go hand in hand. Thank you. Hope you understand. <laughs> Don't go away, Gunther. You stay here, and they will ask you questions from here. Um, 
thank you very much for a very precise, uh, very articulate uh, demonstration of the projects with the parallel discussion. Maybe I could start because I think when we had this uh, conversation upstairs in the yes. jury of the students, there was uh, quite a lot of emphasis on the question of process and the way of developing the work. And uh, in the exhibition, I think there is a lot of emphasis on this because of the kinds of models and the kinds of drawings. But I think it would be very good if in terms of your own project, you touched on many aspects, the role of the architect, the relationship to the politics, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the circumstances of developing the project, if you could say a few words how you do that in the office, given the size of the office and so on, how, what kind of processes do you actually use in order to uh, develop the projects in the, in, the way that you, in the way that you want? Yes, as I said, we, we prefer to design in competitions. And we take the papers, and I go to a, an architect and say, start. <laughs> <laughs> and the, then he's, he, he's thinking about this, and he's looking for the place. And then after three, four, five days, we are sitting around and talking about and, he's, uh, and, and he says, I think this and this and that. We are listening at first, not talking, listening at first. And then we say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should try this once more and maybe try it this way. And he's looking uh, further. And then three days or four days later, we meet again. <coughs> in the same place, the same place, once more, and once more, and once more, and once more. And sometimes the, there's a good design. <laughs> <laughs> but for example, in terms of the kinds of models, the, relate, the issue of translation, yes, I think, yes. is very interesting. Yeah, be, what be, kind of drawings, yeah. what kind, do you, do you yes, feel you have? Yes, you have. I think you can do what you want. I think we should change the kind of work. Here, writing, sketching, drawing, building models, always change. If you have done a drawing or a sketch, he comes and look, my sketch. I say, yes, good, do a model. <laughs> are, there, are the tutors listening? No. And, so, <laughs> and so he finds the problems. Also, yes, we talk, but we don't talk too much. We have to start drawings, building models, doing sketches. In doing sketches or drawings, in doing wrong, one see what's wrong, and one can find the right way. Yes, we have to, you have to do, you have to do, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's very easy to talk about very intelligent and clever and so on. For that's, uh, young people can do, can speak, but maybe they can draw. Can yes, and then the problem of the computers. I should talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that too. One week before we decided, no think, no sketch, no drawing. We can do by hand, is allowed to do by computer. You know, no one. No one. And own, no list you can do by hand. No, no words you can do. You are allowed to do in do with the computer. For people designing the software, they are not good architects. You know, they are very stupid. <laughs> they wouldn't, uh, if they were good architects, they wouldn't design the software. <laughs> <laughs> and so, over the computers, come back, Come, 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 
bad architects in your office by the computer and you have to cut it. Here it is. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we like to draw freehand, free you know, freehand in the landscape. In drawing and sketching, yes, you do drawing, but you learn what it is you have to draw. You, you look around and so and so and so and so. And uh, some, yes, 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 yes. And if you do sketch, one sketch, then you have such a big packet of sketches. And suddenly you see things you haven't drawn. They suddenly come things out. That's I, desi I designed. <laughs> and <laughs> you, you should you should should keep open the way <coughs> uncontrolled things come out. You yeah, know, so you should you have to open, to open. not close by computer. And then. Yes, I should say. Uh, meanwhile... But I heard you have bought a computer in the office. Yes, we have computers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, indeed. It's a fascination, fascination. The computers, are, uh, they, uh, but they, they close the mind, you know. They, that's a very closed system. And if you want to, open, to, to work open, you can't use these things. It's impossible. I, I, sorry, I disagree completely. Sorry? I, 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 I can you speak to the microphone so that others can hear you? <laughs> Jeff, can Joel, I'm sorry. I can only disagree completely with your view of computers, and it may be the way that you were, you were looking at it or the, or the way that you were working with it, but it, that's the first time I've heard you use words with prejudice. And somehow they didn't sit right in yeah, in terms uh, of this evening. As I know that uh, I, I I wrote a, a, a I saw a, in a magazine a text of text that yes, okay, text, text of, of Gary Frank Gary Frank and he or of his office and he said what he is doing with the computers and. Then I uh, saw a text by Eisenman, and he said, what he is doing with the computers, and then my partner uh, was in USA extra for things, this Eisenman building, where well, he wrote with the computer, he was turning around and so on. And he said, there, there was nothing he couldn't do without computer. But there were a lot of mistakes we hadn't done. <laughs> so it is, I, I, you can use them. And uh, I hope a lot of you use computers for my, my place in architecture is better. <laughs> if you use computers. <laughs> I wonder if you could say a few words about how you see your uh, commitment to uh, the political situation in Germany. What must Feigl come here? Uh, with respect to, uh, yeah, with respect to uh, the political developments, uh, the Olympic Stadium and the Bundestag, um, and the other German architects such as Matthias Ungers and Sharoon. In other words. Could you position yourself a bit with respect to other German architects? I know, for instance, you attacked very strongly Jim Sterling's Stuttgart building. And I wonder how you see uh, political, the political um, work of, of, say, Ungers. Ungers. And, and also Sharoon. Yes, I have so done.
I think we are open for many influences, our office. Influences seen by me or for me, but <laughs> yes, the architects in our office stay only three, four years and then, then they leave. So we have a, a large moving, moving, moving in our, in our office. <coughs> and they come in our office, yes, they are selected by themselves. Uh, n not everyone comes in our office, only. But they bring with themselves the spirit of the time, you know? You know, they bring it. And I think that's the best thing for me. I can sit and <laughs> And they bring the time to me. It's it's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Okay, and what is it that you uh, must say about the political Einstellung of Sharon and political Einstellung of Hunger? I can. Also, I don't know Stuttgart uh, Ungers personally. Uh, don't well. I, I have been seen two or three times. And that's all. But I don't like his architecture. <laughs> he, but I think he's one of, he's not a, not a small architect. He's an architect and he's a good architect, but I don't like this kind of architecture. He is thinking in closed systems, you know, closed formal systems. And we try to open, to open no closed system, thinking and working and so no form, no closed formal system. But he says, I don't know if, if he's thinking, but he says, I repro reproduce the view of the world or anything else. And he says, the secret of the world. And the secret of the world must be a quarter or anything else. I don't know. Ne? Must be a thing like this. Ne? So he's, he is, but he's a good architect. But. Uh, He's very one-dimensional in his architecture, but he's, he's hard-working and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and with, with a good finish. <laughs> with a good finish. So I, would, I wouldn't like to say anything about Ungers, uh, but I don't like it. <laughs> 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 Sharoon, sorry, Sharoon, uh, you have Peter Blundell Jones in, in England. He's the best Sharoon fan, you know. And Sharoon is a special German German way of architecture. I think his philosophy was not very was not uh, was a little bit vague, vague, vague. And uh, but he tried not to be hard to the lines, to the things, to the rooms, to the walls. He was open too. Huh? He was open. He was open, yes. And yes. We try to be open too, yeah. But I think we have a lot of influence. We had we had uh, we have the, 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 he was in Kraus and Karlsruhe, Egon Eiermann, you know Egon, Egon Eiermann? He was a very good architect, a very good architect, and uh, not really well known. He, he hasn't his place in the history. Uh, he influenced us. I think we, I was influenced by Schmidthenner too. Schmidt, you know Schmidthenner? Uh, one can see Schmidthenner as a Nazi architect, and then can see him as an ecological architect. Ecolo and ecological? Ecological architect. Ecological architect. And if we see this line, he was a very good man. Eh? Mm -hmm. And so we, ha we have a lot of influences, but mm -hmm. I think the, the time is not so that one can see, say, the, la the last, or the, the last, last secret of our world is geometry. That's not true at this time. It was 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Not today. 
there we have other structures in, in science and so on. And so I think Ungers and the others, they are in, on a line uh, very dangerous. But they, they work very sure, they have no, no risk. I, I think uh, it's very uh, interesting and I like this different points of view at our world and at our, and, and architecture like this. Charles, do you have the microphone? Um, you, ma you mentioned in your lectures that you um, were trying or you, you were actually making buildings which each time were bespoke. So one form for one brief, every building specific. Um, and on the other hand, the so history of building for the last 2,000 or more years suggests that many buildings have been made the same have been in some way standardized or have been, have been made typical. And also, um, you have um, suggested that now the method of commissioning of architecture has changed, that developers have more of a say. I wonder whether you actually see some limits to how bespoke, how specific buildings can be made to um, particular briefs. No, 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 no. I try wegschieben, was heißt wegschieben? To push, push the limits out for me. I try. I try to open the field for me, but I see most architects have very narrow limits and small limits and they are happy. For they mustn't decide anything and not, they are not responsible, responsible for the things outside their small limits. But I, I like it. It's a funny world. How, how, how far do you think the limits can be pushed? So we make the grenzen in our ship. Grenzen los. Immer weiter. Immer weiter. Brian, can you pass that? Um, I'd like to bring the, your, your discussion back to politics again, unfortunately, perhaps a little more specifically about the Bundestag building. Um, it seems very admirable spectacle to be able to view the parliament in those transparent walls and it, it seems the very model of a kind of space of rational communication, to use a, a phrase which I think is close to what um, was invented by Jürgen Habermas. But uh, there's a specific uh, aspect of that design which I've always been intrigued by, uh, as indeed would be the case w with any political meeting place, which is the specific arrangement of the seating and the spacing of the seating in relation to the speakers and the ranking of the parties and how you dealt with that. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you had more things to say, or you Yes, we had. Uh, you want to go on with your argument? No, 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 that's fine. The the <laughs> about the kind of the seats you would like to see. Yes, there was a long discussion. <coughs> I think an Englishman can understand German political situation. We have, we, have, we have a very difficult relationship to our, to our government, to sta start, 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 start? State. State. To, to the state. We, we, di we divide the society and the state. Society are we, the state is our. <laughs> and we think the parliament 
is part of the society, civil society. And so they are sitting around and talking about the things. Not the government here, and the parli parliamenters, the parliaments here, <coughs> no. Not so around. And it was a, a large discussion. And uh, Cole came and said, we had for him a place in the first room. <laughs> there was more places. <laughs> 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 and he came and looked. Self-consciousness of the parliament, of the, uh, the parliament, <coughs> which organized this form, organized this form. It was a free, free play of power and so on. And so on. It was very interesting. And now in Berlin, uh, there uh, Sir Norman Foster is, and he is. He's designing another <coughs> seating plan. Yes, yes. <laughs> 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 he goes back. He goes back. He goes back. He he, he leaves positions we we had got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay, so. yeah. Maybe there could be this last question. Uh, Brian, can you pass the microphone to the front? Oh, thank you. I just wanted to um, ask you if you would to touch on what I see as being certain characteristics of development in your work over a very remarkable and wonderful period of time. I'm interested in the, in the relationship between the apparent fragmentation, elementalizing of the work or aspects of the work, and how that relates perhaps to your very obvious commitment and concern with investigating the social and political dimension of architecture, whether there's a linkage there in this 40 year period. No, I'm Im Büro. Im, ne, in der, in, in der Büro. Ne, in der, und äh, er interessiert sich für diese, die, die formale Strategie der Fragmentation mhm. und ob, das da, ob ein Zusammenhang besteht zwischen sozial und äh, politischen Ideen und dieser Fragmentation. Ne? Ja, ja, also. Tendenziell bin ich etwas aufsässig und nicht sehr pflegeleicht, würde ich sagen. Ein Tendency ist ein bisschen auch revolutionär und nicht sehr gern. Ich misstraue allen geschlossenen Systemen, ob die politisch sind und allen Welterklärungen, geschlossenen Welterklärungen. I don't trust uh, any uh, the Close systems. Mistrust. 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 Mistr
and you can get it. So, so, so. so and the small ones, small is too small. Small things too in architecture. <coughs> I, I, w I wouldn't know how to design a building coming from a, from from a about yeah. I, I wouldn't know how to do it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, monu monument. Yes, you are right. But that's that's a difficult word. It, had, it has very uh, some or any meanings. Yes. Not uh, a large, big monument. I wouldn't like to. No Reichstag. No Reichstag. <laughs> we should close on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.